Knowledge is about overcoming ignorance. Wisdom is about overcoming foolishness. So you understand mm-hmm. wisdom by understanding foolishness. And you understand wisdom, foolishness, as not identical to ignorance. These are the moves you have to make to get the chess pieces on the board if you want to play the game we're going to play, right? And so foolishness, what is it? What do we mean by this? And this is an idea that's born in the Axial Revolution, the specific notion of foolishness. But it's this idea, and I think for ECOG side bears it out. I argue about it. I publish about it. The very processes that make us intelligent problem solvers, make us so adaptive, are the very same processes that make us prone to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. Mm. You don't get one without the other. So you use your intelligence to solve problems, but you use rationality and wisdom to deal with the self-deception that emerges as you're trying to solve your problems. And that's a very different thing. And the thing about these self-deceptions is they don't come as sort of isolated little things. They, they can constellate into complex patterns of self-organization. You know, the confirmation bias can strengthen egocentrism, which can strengthen the degree to which you engage in a kind of narrow framing of situations, which can then feed back into the confirm and you and, and we've published on this, right? You get these massively complex, so the the dynamical complex self organization of your cognition is hijacked by self deceptive processes, and they form these systems that are also mm-hmm. complex and adaptive and hard to intervene on. We called it parasitic processing, the work that Leo and I published, right? John, would you mind giving an example? Because there are people listening, I'm sure a lot of people listening, who pride themselves on being good problem solvers, strong, having strong analytical minds. And they're like, yeah. I don't see how that automatically begets, or not automatically, but how that would beget sure. delusion, self-deception. Okay. Would you mind giving an example, real or hypothetical? Oh, well, let's use a chess example. Okay, so... Here's the problem facing you in chess. You can't actually check all the possible alternative pathways for playing a chess game. The number of alternative pathways is greater than the number of atomic particles in the universe. So even the super fastest chess game can't check all of the possible alternative sequences of actions. So that means that's why, by the way, you know, you get a chess game that beats any human being, or let's do it with Go, you get AlphaGo beats any human being, but then you can make a machine that beats AlphaGo because no AI can algorithmically play and search. So what we have to do is we have to bias what information we check. This is the paradox. It sounds like a Zen Cohen, right? You're intelligent because of your ability to ignore so much information in a way that makes obvious to you the relevant information enough of the time that you're a very good problem solver in very many many domains. So you're playing chess. What's a good heuristic? Control the center board. I've played with somebody who was controlling the center board. I realized that they were biasing their attention that way. And so I played a peripheral game and beat them because they focused on... Now, should people not focus on the center board? Well, no, it's a very good heuristic. But it's a heuristic. It's not an algorithm. This is is a formal thing. It's called the no free lunch theorem. There is no problem-solving method that will universally solve all your problems. In fact, Mm -hmm. the area above the line of average problem solving where it's improving your performance is equal to an area under the line where it degrades your performance. Every bias is just a heuristic misfiring and every heuristic is just a bias that happens to be working for us in a lot of contexts. They're (laughs) interchangeable together. And so even when you're doing analytic stuff, you're confronting this, you often realize the way you framed the problem is actually what's preventing you from solving the problem. You have to have that aha moment that Mm -hmm. breaks you out of it. But when you're trapped in it, that's, that's, that's a form of self-deception. You can't really lie to yourself. What you do is you, you bias your attention to find the wrong thing salient in a way that binds you to trying to solve it in a particular manner. This shows up in interpersonal context. I'm sure you've had something like this as an experience. Oh, oh, I thought she was angry, but she's afraid. She's afraid, not angry. I've been going at this all wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. But that doesn't mean that sometimes people aren't angry at you and you shouldn't see them as angry at you, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And so even the most analytic thing you're doing is dependent on pure logic. 
you're going in to do a logic class. This is from my history, and a lot of people will back me up on this. For a while, what you're doing is you're practicing doing all the machinery of the transformations and the logic trees and all the derivations, and you just got to practice that. And then you realize, but I'm still not getting, like, really, I'm still only getting Bs and lower As. Like, what's going on? And you, and you keep getting docked, not on the logic, but how you translated natural language into the logic, for which there is no logical procedure, Right. And, and so you, that translation process, right, is needed in order to get the logical machinery running, but it is not itself governed in a purely logical manner. It requires this flexibility, this reframing, this insight, this kind of stuff.